So good morning and welcome back from your breakout room conversation. Um, my name is Louise van Rijn. Uh, I'm going to be your host for this conversation today about leading complex social change. And I will introduce you in a minute to your two main panelists, but I also want to invite all of you to participate as actively as you possibly can and to share your thoughts on the chat and to join in in this conversation. Uh, but before we continue, let's just hear from maybe one or two people um, what struck you about the conversation you just had. So don't give us the content, maybe just, just as a way of bringing your voice into this conversation. What struck you about the conversation you just had? And you can literally just unmute yourself and share something about what came out of your conversation, your small group conversation. I'll keep an eye on who's unmuted and you'll immediately get an opportunity to speak. And at the moment, everybody's waiting. Margaret. I always break the silence, Louise, as you know. It was just interesting that two people I was with were really seeking for a way forward of understanding, recognizing that the situation in the world had changed, was changing, and therefore needed different approaches and different ways forward. Thank you very much, Margaret. Maybe one other person? Hi, Louise Pina here. Um, I, was, I was very moved by, by uh, a member of my group um, who says that he, he is in an industry that's doing very well and financially, they're not battling. In fact, they, in, they have a growth tra uh, trajectory but he's here to, to learn more about what other companies, obviously other businesses in his ecosystem, what's happening and how other people are dealing. So he wants to understand what other people are feeling and going through at this time. So I found that quite a, a, a lovely approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pina. It's about us showing up with curious learners rather than people who think we know. We have all the answers. So my two guests today are um, Julian Day and Greg Grunmeyer. Now there's a whole long story about how this conversation happened and I said I'm going to start just by sharing, you, sharing that story. Julian and I got to know each other 15 years ago when I came back from, from the UK and I had just finished my doctorate in large scale complex social change and the two of us kind of just had this amazing connection. Uh, we had a mutual friend, Johann Strumpfer, who, who kind of, I think Johann brought the two of us together. Um, and then a, a while ago, I, I discovered that Julian had just written this book, Systemic Stairway, and that he's doing some really interesting work. So I was curious to know more about it and then uh, arranged a conversation. And in the conversation, it was um, Kim, my colleague, Matthew, Julian's colleague, and, and Julian and myself. And um, I have to be careful, my daughter's just walking, she's 18, I'm not sure she's ready for this conversation. Because it felt like OD, I, you know, the best way I can describe it was like an OD orgasm. I was like so excited about that conversation that I had with Julian that I decided I can't do this on my own. I have to invite other people into this conversation because it would be so unfair to keep this for myself. So that's how this conversation came about. And I then, we then said, how do we kind of plan it? And I said to, I asked Julian, you know, maybe we should invite someone else. And so Greg is a mutual friend. So my first question to Julian and Greg are going to be, why did you say yes to this invitation? What was it about this invitation that kind of piqued your interest, Julian and then Greg? Um, I think I was just sorry that we had to stop talking, you know, when we were having our conversation before, because, um, you know, sometimes you talking to somebody and you know you're talking to a kindred spirit, you know, that, you know, we actually haven't seen each other for quite a while. And yet we're sort of ending up asking ourselves the same questions in the same area about change, about complexity and about leadership. And I think we have a mutual worry that perhaps um, we could do a lot better in the way that we go about developing leadership. So I think in a nutshell, that would be it. 
Thank you, Julian. And we're going to come back a little bit to, for you to share your credentials. But let's go to Greg and just, you know, Greg, why did you say yes to that in, to this invitation? Well, I, I think it's, if those who know Louise, if Louise invites you, you just say yes and you turn up. Someone said that earlier on, so I just thought I had to repeat that story. Uh, I'm only joking. Um, yeah, so um, Julian and I worked together many, many years ago. It was the mid-80s. And, uh, in the, and Julian's always been an interesting character for me in that uh, he was always reading interesting books and bringing concepts in it. And uh, so then Louise came back from their conversation. So Louise and I are also very good friends, and we met also about 15 or so years ago. And I think we are really kindred spirits around the, the, the challenge of organizations and what do we do about the leadership and, and changing organizations to better places to work through leadership. And uh, she shared that she shared uh, the, the conversation and also the fact that she discovered I know Julian. Um, uh, so then, and, and everything just resonated. And uh, yeah, so I, so I think we uh, we all come from the same the same room in terms of uh, looking at, at the world at the moment, and and we see this challenge and probably humble enough to know that none of us have the answers, but we determined to lean into this and and do something about coming up with reasonable answers so that we're not victims of of the, the the reality of the situation. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. So Julian, so that people in this room get a sense of who you are. You've been, you've been, I remember the first time I met you, you were involved in, in some of the business schools. You probably have taught at all the business schools in South Africa by now. Uh, you're a, you're a, you know, any young person could be, could, could start, think of you as a guru, but um, <laughs> we know you're just a nice guy. So tell us a little bit about your background and, 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 and how it is that you came to think about the world in the way that you are, that you think about it now. Um, well, after I decided that I wasn't going to be a professional saxophone player, um, I got involved in um, IT and I became a computer programmer. Um, I think in 1980, somewhere around there, I could call myself a, a computer programmer. This, this was back in the days of mainframe computers. And I spent 20 years in the IT industry going from, you know, programmer through to systems analyst, project manager, working on big systems and big organizations. And the thing that was interesting was that in 1980, when I first um, joined the industry, we had a failure rate of about 15%. So if you converted that into dollar terms around the world, it was billions of dollars that get wasted because IT projects, software development, these projects fail. And we used to call ourselves um, software engineers and engineers can't have a failure rate of 15%. That would be horrific. We would never get on an airplane. We probably wouldn't do anything if that was our um, failure rate. So I was involved in the industry as a junior sort of person while they said, we've got to get our act together. You know, we, we've, we've got to do something about it. So people like myself and Greg, um, who was a colleague of mine, we would have gone on umpteen project management courses. We would have gone on software development methodologies. There was a concerted effort to um, take this situation and turn it around. So if we fast forward 15 years, somewhere around about 1995, somewhere around there, the failure rate had gone up to 75%. So, you know, I got to the point where I said, I can't carry on doing this. I can't go to work with the odds so heavily stacked against me. And I started to wonder what the problem was. And, um, you know, eventually I, I came to some conclusions. You try some things out. Most of it doesn't work. But eventually you start rethinking the paradigms um, and eventually you start getting involved in, I think maybe I can see a way forward, um, but it involves the paradigm shifts. And I, did, I, I, I started to realize that, um, you know, um, what I was geared up for was dealing with a complicated world. We were good at that. We could deal with com complicated, but we couldn't deal with complex. 
And once you start understanding the difference between complicated and complex, um, we're very, very skilled in the complicated world. We operate as solution providers and we can call ourselves solution providers and we can do it. But complex, our methodologies, our project management, uh, um, things that we were supposed to use did not help us with complexity. And so that's when I um, started uh, doing my, my research and ended up doing my PhD which um, I, I graduated in 2000, uh, I think it was. And then one day um, the Graduate School of Business asked me to come and teach some MBAs. And my methodology for my research was action research. So they wanted me to teach these MBAs action research. So I went there for an evening, petrified, never done anything like that before. <laughs> and um, discovered that they liked it and that I liked it. And so now I'm a combination of, I teach um, the methods that I use. I constantly research them and develop them, but I'm a practitioner. I'm very much a practitioner. So um, I try to keep a balance between, you know, teaching what I've learned and also actually working with that stuff in the real world. I don't know if that gives you a, a background, Louise. It does, and we're going to learn more. And I'm specific. This is this is. So I'm hoping everybody else is getting a sense as to why why I was just so. I mean, I'm back there. I'm so excited about this conversation. So what I didn't know, Julian, is that you and I shared that um, program, software engineer background, and that we both worked as as software programmers and project managers. And 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 I'm so curious about what was it about that time because. I started my, my career in IT very similar time to you. Um, I had the amazing opportunity to um, lead a large implementation in the national chest group of hospitals in, in, in the UK. And we were very successful. So we, our project was really, we, we managed to get delivered time and time again, on time, under budget. We didn't, we weren't under the 15%. And I couldn't make sense of that. I couldn't understand what that was about. So then I wanted to be able to speak about it. So it ended, I ended up doing my, doc, uh, my, my MBA in an attempt at Stellenbosch in an attempt to figure out what this was about and didn't get any answers, not a single answer with regard to, and it was because we were working in complexity in exactly what you're saying and MBA was designed to, under, to explain complex, complicated. So that then led me to this, a kind of change leadership world. Uh, I have a big issue with the term change management. I think that's just silly, can't manage change. Long story short, ended up doing, as you know, my doctorate in com complexity with the Center of Management of Complexity in, in, um, in the UK. And I had the opportunity to come back and then, then do this project called Partners for Possibility, which I think is a complex solution for a complex challenge. With mm. my return into the kind of, more of a organizational development world. I'm so fascinated to hear that so many of the conversations have not moved at all in the last 10 years. And I think people yeah. are still holding on to that fantasy of certainty and having the answers mm -hmm. and, you know, just need to follow these steps and then it'll be a solution. And I'm, I'm, I just don't believe that stuff anymore. So I'm delighted that there's so many connections. But, but one of the things that connect you and Greg are that you are both musicians, so you both started life as musicians, and then, and you both have an IT background, and so Greg, just to, for people to get a sense of who you are. Okay, so yeah, so thanks Louise. I started in IT a bit before Louise and Julian, it's probably the late 70s, um, so we still had the punch cards when I started. And uh, yeah, and, and very similar story to Julian. The only thing is I stayed in, in, in the IT world. And then I ended up where um, for the last 20 years or so, um, I've been the change leader in that um, I've been invited to quite a few of the large corporates to come and fix up the IT departments that were having 50, 40% success rates on their projects. So fix up, fix up the delivery. And then also our culture in, in terms of we don't like our IT departments or they're not 
they're not business aligned and it's we can't attract talent we can't retain talent so that was so i was a practitioner in that i had mandates to 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 do change within organizations and then i owned the, i owned the results of what i was doing as well um and so that so that was my practice field and, I, and i'm i'm really counted as a as a privilege to have done that and and, and so i have lots of wounds and um and uh, war stories to tell um uh, so my my back full of stab wounds and then um we've had like i've had i've experienced success and i've experienced big failure as well in this whole thing and it's, one of the key questions of course is why do you say a thing is successful or why do you say a thing is is a failure so what are the metrics of effective transformation or slash change and then um uh, and is there a person that can lead that thing you know we 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 love our heroes the the one person that's riding on the white horse in front of 10,000 people who we can identify as the person who made it happen and so that's a, and that's been very much the metaphor that um, i operated in and and, f- and a few years ago it really just a clear sense that we're not dealing with the complexity of change and it's sometimes easy to put in a it system but the context for that it system is a big failure so the in the back to the, the issue of complexity so for, from an it perspective last 20 years has been about the it as well as the organization and the ecosystem around it which has been the whole space and it's all the same issues um uh, it's all the the same questions it's the issue of power how do we do this um what does success look like what mandates do you have um etc 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 so yeah so so um so the good news is in my world at the moment is I've left that behind so I can I can play a consultant role in helping other organizations based on my my uh, experience and uh, and exposure and learning and and, and personal research, research I've done through the years okay Thank yeah Nick. so now what I want to do is I just want to invite everybody now that you've got a sense as to who these people are if you've got comments, questions, reflections, anything that you post in the chat, we're going to keep our eyes on that. But um, and and the the purpose for this next hour of this conversation is really for us to get to know Greg, um, Julian's perspective on systemic stairway a bit better. He's he's dropped some thoughts which I at the time thought I don't want to go here now. I want to go there in the, with, with a larger group. So we're going to go deeper into that. Um, so please feel free to share anything that you want to share in the chat. So Julian, I want, um, are you able to give us the kind of executive summary of systemic stairway? And um, when, when, when you go into organizations as a practitioner, uh, a collaborator, a partner to people who are having to deal with stuff, what, what is it that you do and, and what is your approach? <clears throat> um, well, um, I'm a facilitator, not a solution provider. So when I go into the situations, um, I haven't ever a clue what the answer is. But what I'm really interested in is what's their question. So if you think about complexity, what you've normally got is um, people who have multiple perspectives. You know, they don't agree. Um, They might all think they've got the right answer. They might all think that they haven't a clue what the answer is. It doesn't really matter. And they would be involved in a conversation probably that's going nowhere and they're struggling to make sense of their situation. So what I always do is I take that um, and ask them, what's the question that they all want an answer to? Because when you convert a problem into a shared question, collaboration becomes possible. So my research is basically on how do you get people to collaborate in complex situations. And you're in business, if you, if those people can say, look, we haven't a clue what the answer is, but we do have a question that we're trying to answer. And this in question is important to all of us. And then they're gonna ask me if I know what the answer is. And the and no, I have not a clue because I have to work in every single type of industry with every single type of group from junior to very senior and really what I do is a three-step process it's um, I get them to make sense of things because 
with complexity, there's no right answer, you know, um, but there is agreement or there's the possibility of reaching agreement. So my job is to get people to make sense of things together and reach agreement as quickly as they can. You know, if, if they can reach agreement slowly, um, but then maybe they don't need me. But if they can reach agreement quickly, that's worth um, sort of, uh, th 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 that's a benefit that, that, that I can offer. So once we've made sense of a situation, it's a matter of making executable decisions, decisions that actually can be implemented. And this is very difficult because um, I'm still actually surprised at how poor people are at making decisions. They often come up with a hope or a dream, you know, something like um, we must uh, get the right information to the right people at the right time. That's not a decision, that's a hope and a dream. But how do you convert that into something that you can actually execute? So that would be really the second thing. And the third thing is the, th is the Cinderella. It's about this um, execution problem that we find all over our organizations. It's just, can we get something done? And however good our decisions are, they won't miraculously implement themselves. And so it's a process of securing commitment from people who's actually going to do what and, and getting a, a, a sort of irrevocable commitment to implement. So if you can do that, if you can go into a messy situation and get people to agree on the question, make sense of it very quickly, turn that into executable decisions, and then don't forget to secure the commitment that actually going to get those um, questions implemented, then you can have real impact and real change. That's my short answer. I hope it's a short answer to your question. Well, uh, so I, I obviously, I, I love that approach. But, but, you know, when I go to any of these big banks, we've got a few banks represented on this call. Um, typically, what they want is the solution. They're not always yeah. interested in, in having to do this hard work and having to kind of, you know, deal with not having the answers and what they really want is just someone to kind of go well you just need to step these 10 steps will get you and it feels this is my point it feels to me that we're in 1993 i remember that we had in 1993 a, a methodology 32 steps towards dealing with with resistance i mean what a stupid idea that is and it still feels to me that that's what client wants to buy they want to buy the 32 steps to dealing with resistance rather than being willing to deal with the messiness and the complexity and the um so greg i'm sure you've seen you've you've experienced this as well i'm wondering whether you're sitting with a question to to julian before i ask you my question yeah um, I, i've got about 10 questions for julian yes so i'm just trying to i'm wondering which one do i lead with first but um Louise, I do think you, um, you point to a, rea a harsh reality, and I come out of the corporate world, where um, these very powerful executives with big, big bank accounts want quick solutions. Okay. And Julian, and you just finished saying that I don't sell solutions because I don't know what the answers are to your complexity. So, um, so that raises a big issue in my head. So how do we have these conversations with these mighty CEOs and their boards, where they're used to the, and I won't mention names because they might be in the room, um, you have these big fives and these consultancies that we all see the adverts on the billboards. They come and they sell solutions to these people, okay? So, and we're talking about a new way, an alternative way of, so how do we engage people that come from a paradigm where I'm looking for a nail or a screw that's gonna really fix this thing? And Julian, just before you answer the question, um, so, so, so it, it really does feel to me as if, as if we are flying against the procurement rules because, you know, people say to me, I want the three-year plan for, with milestones and deliverables to implement culture change. And, and here's the contract and the procurement guys have signed on, up on that. And I kind of go, how, how does that, how, how does anybody compute that that's, well, that's how, how procurement process work? So, yeah, so it's, it's, I'm curious to know how you navigate that space. Well, I can tell you what normally happens. Um, 
um, is somebody will, ref you know, I'll get a phone call or it might be somebody I know or somebody I don't know, but I'll get a phone call and they'll start describing their problem. And what I do is I, while they're talking, I'm trying to figure out what is their question. And the minute you turn their problem into a question, it, I'll say something like, it sounds like this is your question. Everything changes, um, things seem to go calmer. It's quite therapeutic. But the minute somebody converts their um, problem into a question, um, um, I think what happens is they go into learning mode. So when we are when we are sitting around, you know, with a problem that won't go away, and then we turn it into a question, you open up the possibility of learning. And I will, I'll say to them, you know, I, I can't answer that question, but what I can do is I can help you to answer it for yourself. And as long as they know that that process is going to be quick, they're okay. You know, we're not going to spend six months answering this question. We'll, we, we're going to answer it. We'll, we'll need a couple of days. Um, and I'm sure that you're saying, hang on a second. How can you deal with complexity in a couple of days? But you can. It's, um, you, you know, it's a matter of, um, okay, let's get into a room. Or these days, we don't even have to get into a room. We, we do it all over the place these days in our slippers. Um, you know, get, let's get these perspectives out. Um, what do you think? What do you th Get them out very quickly. Um, there's some very good systems thinking tools that allow you to synthesize multiple perspectives and get to a point where you can actually make sense of things very quickly. We usually do it in a morning. It's actually the easy part, but getting people to then agree on decisions, uh, that, that takes some time. I think my answer to the question is, if they get a sense uh, that, that you can actually do this quickly, you, 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 you basically finesse that thing about, I want a quick fix. But I think what you're talking about is, is really, how do we commission work when we are in a complex situation? I think that really goes down to the, to the hub of the problem. Because I think what's happening is when they're saying, I want a quick fix, I want a solution, they're confusing, complicated and complex. If they really knew the difference, they would never ask you to do that. Say a bit more. Um, it, it might be useful just to very simply kind of lay out a distinction. Can I take maybe five or 10 minutes to do that? Is, is that all right? Mm. Let's take um, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones um, gets up one morning, his car won't start. Well, his car is complicated, but um, there are people out there who know how to fix it. Mechanics will know how to fix his car. So Mr. Jones could phone up a mechanic that he trusts, let's say an honest mechanic and say, look, my car won't start, please can you fix it? Now, what Mr. Jones is doing is commissioning that mechanic to fix his car. And there should be no problem here because um, the mechanic has done a lot of learning. And if you ask 10 mechanics to fix the car, they probably all come up with the same solution. You know, there's a reason why it's not working. Complicated things can be debugged by experts. And there's no commissioning problem if you've got a complicated situation, like your car won't start, and you commission a solution provider to um, fix it. The thing that's always interesting, um, and I learned this from my, you know, from Johann Strumpfer, who was a mutual friend, he said that the question that you must always be asking yourself is who is learning? And in this situation, Mr. Jones is learning nothing because he doesn't need to because the mechanic has done all the learning on his behalf. But there is a possibility that Mr. Jones might say, you know what, I actually think I, I want to fix my own cars. I, so, and if I weigh up the cost benefit, I see a benefit in doing the learning myself. 
So Mr. Jones could actually acquire these skills. There's books, there's a body of knowledge. He could do a course, phone a friend, whatever. But in a complicated situation, we're not having any problems at all. We all have cars that we don't understand and we manage it through delegation, basically. But there is the option for us to do our own learning. Now, Mr. Jones might go through a period in his life where he struggles with his marriage. Now, his marriage is complex. It's completely different to his car. Um, his car doesn't have a value system. His car doesn't care whether it's working or not. But Mr. and Mrs. Jones do have a value system and they do care whether their marriage is working. So perhaps Mr. Jones has got a, a neighbor who's happily married and he goes to the neighbor and he says, can you help? Now, we, we've got a big difference here because there's no right answer to marriage. There's a gazillion ways to be happy and a gazillion ways to be unhappy. And Mr. Jones's neighbor might say, look, I can give you some advice. Um, this is what I suggest. Who's learning? Well, you know, um, really what's happening is the neighbor is transferring their learning onto Mr. Jones. And Mr. Jones looks at this and says, I'm not sure that that will work for me. Goes and asks another neighbor. Nah. And what we end up with is instead of, um, you know, one uh, 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 the same answer from 10 different people, you get 10 different answers from 10 different people. And then we know we're dealing with complexity. So the solution provider approach doesn't really work because um, um, Mr. Jones is, is, is gonna struggle to take the advice of, of somebody else because it won't fit in with his value system, his beliefs, etc. There is a, um, a, another possibility is that um, if you can't commission your neighbor to sort out your own marriage, maybe you can go to some kind of best practice. So what happens then is some researcher will set off and do a whole lot of um, research and end up consolidating some research and say, this is best practice, Mr. Jones. And this is pretty much the way that the consulting industry works. And if you think about it really carefully, what's happening is they're treating something complex as if it was complicated, as if there is best practice. Now, this is a horrific um, thought. For example, if we're thinking about our parastatals that are in a, a terrible situation, and that the way that we want to sort out these parastatals is by getting in an army of consultants who are going to help us with best practice. You know, does best practice in, um, let's say, ESCOM, does it really work? You know, in the same way as you wouldn't ask for best practice to fix your marriage, is you, are you going to get best practice to fix your parastatals? I know that this is a little, maybe a little bit contentious. It took me two years to get my head around all of this. There is a third possibility. Mr. and Mrs. Jones could say, you know what, we're confused. When we're confused, the only way we um, get rid of confusion is by learning and sense making. But we need to do that learning, not other people. So how are we going to learn? Well, they could ask for a facilitator, because what is a facilitator going to do? The facilitator is going to say, I haven't a clue how you're going to fix your marriage. But I can help you have an intelligent conversation where you'll figure things out for yourself. So the only thing that I can provide you with is the conversation that's gonna help you. Now, please don't all log off, but, but I am a facilitator. And if people ask me what I do for a living, I, what I really should say is that I'm a conversation designer. But if I said that you know, at a cocktail party or something, nobody would ever talk to me again. But I really think that, that that's what facilitators do. They, they design the conversation that's going to um, uh, help people learn. And if Mr. and Mrs. Jones learn and reach agreement, and you've helped them with not with the, with the content, but with the, the vehicle that's going to help with them with their learning, they'll say, we learned, 
we've agreed and therefore we're going to implement. And the reason that we have a lot of um, projects that don't work in organizations, why there is an execution problem, I think and I very much believe is that we don't really know what facilitation is. It's a word that means all sorts of things to all sorts of people, but I don't think that we can deal with complexity if we, if we don't understand facilitation. And I think Louise and I, when we were having our orgasmic conversation um, a little while ago, um, you know, I think, I think we were saying, you know, maybe this is the thing that we're missing in leadership development. If you're going to the, um, the various places, I'm not going to single out business schools because you have in-house um, curriculums, etc. But I really think that a lot of the problems that we're having in the world is because we tackle complex situations with a solution provider mindset and we don't really know what facilitation is. But you can, if you can actually get people very quickly to, to sort things out for themselves. And it takes a long time to get somebody else to sort it out for you. I don't know if that's, is that okay, Louise? It's okay, it's fabulous. I'm, I'm sure lots of people are listening. I want to, I'm loving to, would love to hear some of your thoughts or just read some of your thoughts. In the meantime, I wanna just, I want to hook into what you've just said. So probably my most, the, the, the piece of work I'm proudest of in my life is, is the design of the Partners for Possibility program, which has enabled 1,350 partners around the country to figure stuff out for themselves. And what we've done is we've decentralized leadership development. We've enabled people in Polokwane and Letsitele and Kimberley and whatever, to do the work for themselves with facilitation. Mm. And so for me, the, one, of the, one of the things I'm curious around, I'm, I'm very interested in leadership development, as you know, I'm interested in getting out of the, the mindset that says, uh, you know, leaders learn from going to sit in a classroom and have some big person stand at the front of the room, because I don't think that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. I think we learn through doing stuff and failing and trying again and reflecting on it and having another go and, you know, that kind of social process of, of development. And, and I'm part of a group of people who are currently looking at if we had to rethink leadership development for South Africa, given our South current reality, how would we do it? And the one thing I know for a fact, and I'm really sorry if we have anybody on the call who's going to be offended. The one thing I know is it's not going to be sit people sitting in classrooms, listening to some clever person standing at the front of the room, talking at them. Mm. I know that it's going to be through, through service. That's the one thing that just seems to be internationally. There's this when we serve, we, we learn in a way that we can never learn by, by being the recipient of stuff coming our way. Um, and you've also, you've got some stories around that as well. I want to hear some thoughts from, from Greg before we come back to you, Julian. But just so, so I think there's something about leadership development programs well facilitated. So I'm with you on the facilitation. I think we need to develop our capacity to do that at scale in this country. We, we have to get out of the mindset that says, I will go to this hallowed, you know, space of higher learning and then we'll come back being a leader because I just don't in, in in this VUCA world that we live in I just don't think that's how it works mm -hmm. it is challenging because because the leadership development people are in a in a quandary because you know do I go for this big name or that big name or that big name this idea of messy programs where people mm -hmm. are going to be facilitated to figure stuff out for themselves and they cannot just call on the you know, solution from said solution provider, that's scary. And, and um, I think part of what our job is, those of us who have enough, you know, we've all got the scars to show. I have so many scars of thinking I have answers and then realizing that actually I was just selling my client. And there were no answers. Um, I think that's part of what our job is. Our, um, in, in my second half of my life, it's to kind of bring some, um, I don't want to say comfort because it's not comfort, but a, a willingness to live with no answers and mm. a willingness to be with and cope with not knowing and figure out how to keep going even if you don't have a clue what the next step needs to be. 
Mm. And for me, that's the joy of, of, of leading in complexity. But Greg, I'm sure you're sitting there with lots of questions to, to Julian as well, which is why I kind of yeah. invited you. I don't want to have all this pressure on me. I can't deal with it. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so Julian, so, the, so the, you know, we, we're talking about leadership. So there's a lot of people that are um, um, facilitators and uh, change or consultants that, that, that help their clients, okay? But if you're talking about developing leaders that, like I was, that own the systems they are in, and what is that model of leadership? So um, Sengi in his work, uh, he spoke about the three roles of leadership, you know, leader as a designer, architect, leader as the teacher, coach, and leader as the servant. And I'm hearing, and after reading your book and listening to you a few times, I'm hearing very clearly leader as facilitator. So, um, uh, so as a leadership model, are we potentially taking Sengi's model saying we're adding a fourth leg to this chair? As a, as a key competency and way of operating? Mm. You'll have to tell me whether I've answered your question, Greg, but okay. you know, if you're starting to talk about organization, it's something I actually remind myself, you know, back in the day when I used to actually go to organizations and you know, you walk in through the, into the lobby Remind yourself that this, you know, whether it's big or small, it's a conversation. I mean, that's what makes us human. All animals can communicate, you know, monkeys, chimpanzees, ants, whatever, they can communicate, but they can't have conversation. That's the thing that separates us. So when I look at organizations, I see um, the question I ask myself is who is having what conversation and how intelligent are those conversations? And if they are having unintelligent conversations, can I help them to have a more intelligent conversation? So um, I, is that a fourth leg or is it just something that underpins everything? Um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, their, their marriage is dependent on the conversation that they have, you know? Um, and when I think about organizational development, um, that's what I, that's the way I would approach, I approach it is um, what are the conversations that are going to make this organization great? And are they having those conversations? And if not, would they know how to redesign them so that they can get through the stuff that they have to get through at speed, you know, without, without, you know, don't wheel spin. Uh, and when we, when we talk about, um, oh, we've got the silo mentality in our organization and these people don't speak to those people, well, you can't hope for collaboration. You know, you've got to design it. Let, let's design the conversation that you need to have so that the silos break down and you actually end up collaborating. Um, Greg, you're gonna have to tell me whether I've answered your question or not. <laughs> Um, Julian, I think you have in terms of uh, the, the the role of conversation as a as as a as a foundation, a way of life, um, yeah. as a different way of operating versus where we come from. Yeah. Yeah. The um, so, yeah, sorry, Louise. So can I just say, so Greg, so we in um, uh, Patricia Shaw was my study leader in my doctoral program, and she always used to talk about. Uh, conversations are the organizing principle for organizations. It's where we make meaning, it's where we tell stories, is where we figure out what we're going to be focusing our attention on and what we're going to, um, so, so, so that kind of, it is the core process. It is, it is the process of organization. But once we know that, it shifts how we think about leadership. So does my, I remember sitting in an MBA class in a, um, where I was told that leaders should know the way and show the way and give direction. And that really got me into a lot of trouble for a long time because what goes with that is a, is a way of showing up in the world that says my job here is to bring the answers and the solutions and you just all need to stand aside while I tell you what to do because we're going to do it my way. And in a complex world, that is the best way to get yourself into serious trouble. Yeah. And it was only when I realized after many mistakes that, that I think the leaders that we need today are 
people who are willing to say, I genuinely have no idea. And we're going to design a conversation. And I'm going to work with people who don't come with. Those leaders are few and far between. The, the, there's still a story that says, you know, we teach and preach vulnerability and authenticity and all that stuff. But, you know, and you go into not Big, ba big Bank will, will, will remain unnamed. What they want is the solution and the answer and the you come and tell us. And so, so I'm, I'm excited about everybody on this call because, because I also teach people that it really is, if it is to be, it's up to me. And, and can we shift that? Each and every one of us, when we get the opportunity to commission, can we stop commissioning for solutions and, and commission for intelligent conversations? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I almost... Greg, if there's a burning question, otherwise I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a space for one or two other people to say something. Did you have a burning question? Um, the, uh, just uh, the last question, and let's open it up. Julian, you, you, you don't speak about problem solving, if you talk about mess management. And I was, fascin <laughs> I was fascinated by your terminology. And, um, and, and I thought, sure, that's such a, a, a nice term to use to explain complexity. So do you want to just unpack that maybe a bit for us? Greg, if you know, um, you know, we we we've, I don't know, we just about anything. Um, let, let's go back to the days when we were working together. Why isn't this working? Why isn't that working? So and so says this. So and so says that. You know, my head is in a mess. Your head is in a mess. Their head's in a mess. We. You know, if you think you've got the answer and I think I've got the answer and Joe Bloggs thinks he's got, the, it's just a mess, you know. And I think that we just have to understand that that's the way the, the world is. Um, we're bombarded by variables every day. You know, look at COVID-19 or whatever. I mean, we're just bombarded by, and things are in a mess. And all we need to know is we can... There's ways of making sense of a mess. It's just um, we need to have a particular kind of conversation. You know, the question that you ask is quite interesting because um, I was bombarded with the idea, um, you know, when I was in my IT days of um, there are problems and solutions, there's methodologies, there's processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I realized that actually the real problem with the, the IT world, the reason why we've got the 75% failure rate um, is because the IT uh, software development process was just simply an unintelligent conversation. You know, it, you know when, when you try and think, what's the right process? You'll never get there because there is no right process to sort it out. But when you start saying what conversations are needed to, to um, build good software efficiently. Then I became a, a conversation designer and a facilitator, but it took me a long time to, to figure out that that was what the issue was. My job is not to take a methodology and trying to get it to work, you know, because the IT world says this is the methodology that you should use. It's in this particular situation with these particular people, what is the conversation that they need to have in order to build good software? And that was the big shift for me. It was actually the watershed in, moment in my life when I realized, you know, I'm, I'm a conversation designer. That's, that's how I'm earning my living. So Julian, how do we, well, how, what do we deal with, the, what, what do we do with the fact that there's only one Julian and you're now teaching Mathieu. So now we've got two, but we need, we need millions of these people in the world who can, who can facilitate these conversations. And we can't rely on Julian. Um, <laughs> I, I'm getting together, uh, we can teach this basically, that's the short, we can do it, we can, we can teach people the principles of conversation design, it's, 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 my, the, the, the thing that I would warn people about is that they're going to have to go deep into a topic, this is not something that is going to be bedside reading, um, but if you want to take a deep dive into what actually makes collaborations work, it's doable. It's very doable uh, and it can be done experientially. 
And, you know, I believe in action learning. You, you can't learn this, as you rightly say, sitting in a classroom. You've got to get out into the messy world and actually do it. And I think that um, one of the things that's a, a problem is if you look at uh, curriculum, you know, people will say, we do action learning. We've, our um, people have got a project. And then you look at it and what they're actually doing is making recommendations. And recommendations change nothing because who's learning? The wrong people. I'm going back to that question. We've always got to ask who's learning. So if a student goes on a program, learns some stuff, and then you say, now go and apply it. Well, that's applied learning. That's not action learning. Applied learning is go and apply it and come and give us recommendations. Well, they're acting like a consultant. And that changes nothing because people might say, well, that was very interesting, but nothing's changed. But if you commission them to change something, if somebody in the organization says, this is a problem that we want solved, you're going to solve it, but not recommendations. You're actually going to go through sense making, decision making, commitment management, and you're going to actually implement real change. Then, you, then you're changing the way that we teach people. And it is messy. That's fine. You know, it doesn't matter if learning is messy. Um, that, that's fine. So I just, so, so Julian, you know, I've spent 10 years now in the trenches doing this bonus possibility work. And I've, I've, I've commissioned 2021 for me personally to be a year of learning. So I'm definitely going to knock on your door. I do not want to do some online thing with, I want to work with you. So I'm hoping that there's going to be other people on this call who's going to want to hang with us while next year we